All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. I've been going over a series of video presentations I've created for the Rankin Technical College AWD Application and Web Development 1111.NET Framework with Web Databases class. The main textbook for the class, as you can see, is ASP.NET MVC with Entity Framework and CSS by Lee Naylor. I've decided first to go over several of the chapters of a different textbook, that being Professional ASP.NET MVC 5 by John Galloway of Microsoft and others. So far I've gone over Chapter 1, the Getting Started, Chapter 2, Controllers, Chapter 3, Views, and I'm about to start Chapter 4, Models. I am going to cover the first nine chapters. I'm going to skip Chapter 10 on NuGet, skip Chapter 11 on Web API, skip Chapter 12 on Single Page Applications with AngularJS, skip Chapter 13, Dependency Injection, and finish up by going over Chapter 14, Unit Testing, Chapter 15, Extending MVC, Chapter 16, Advanced Topics, and Skipping Chapter 17, Real World ASP.NET MVC Building NuGet, the NuGet website. All right, so again, I'm going to jump right into Chapter 4 here. And as you can see, Chapter 4 is about models. We have previously gone over controllers and views. Now we will add models to the mix. Remember, models is basically, they're the C-sharp classes that will contain our data sources. Typically, a database doesn't have to be, and any business rules that we have that's you know going to be working with those data sources. So what's in the chapter here, how to model the music store, what it means to scaffold, how to edit an album, all about model binding. And again, as we have talked about before, all of the, um, all of the code for the chapter is online. Okay, so you can go out there and find it. All right. In chapter three, we talked a little bit about models, but in this chapter, it's all about models. As it says here, the word model and software development covers all sorts of concepts. And I'm not going to read those. You can see them yourselves. They mention even when one scopes the term model to the context of the, a of the MVC design pattern, you can still debate the merits of having a business-oriented model object versus a view-specific model object. We talked a little bit about that in the last chapter. This chapter, as mentioned here on the bottom of page 75, talks about models as the objects used to send information to the database, perform business calculations, and even render a view. Now, here's the key thing. These objects represent the domain the application is focusing on. Models are the objects you want to display, save, create, update, and delete. So, you've already seen some of this stuff, such as ASP.NET provides a number of tools that we can use to work on, okay, for our stuff. In the Music Store example, as it says, we can sit and write plain C-sharp classes. Album class, shopping cart class, user class, some of these we've already seen. So when you're ready, you can use tools provided by MVC to construct the controllers and views for the standard operations that you're going to, you know, basically um, perform on these objects. The construction work is called scaffolding, but first, as it says, we need some models to work with. So, modeling the music store. In this example, we'll continue with the ASP.NET MVC music store scenario bringing together what we've learned about controllers, views, and adding in models as a third ingredient. All right, it says this left, leaves off where we were previously. For simplicity, we'll start by creating a new MVC application. All right, so they're going to create yet another new MVC Music Store app. I've already got on mine... I've already got somewhere in here, there's mine, MVC Music Store 2. I hate having MVC Music Store 3, but I think that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. So, we are supposed to start off here. 
not sure what I just did, but all right, close that. So start by creating, you know, doing a file, new project. You've done this enough times. This should be second nature to you. Visual C Sharp, web, ASP.NET, web application. Let's just call this a music store. How about music store chapter four? There, how's that? <clears throat> so I've given it a name. I'm going to click OK. You know this, how it opens up the dialog. We want to tell it to work with MVC. And I don't think they want us to change the authentication. Again, authentication will be the subject of Chapter 7 of this text. The template gives you everything you need to get started, the basic view, layout view, a default home page with a link to the customer login, an initial style sheet, and a relatively empty models folder. Okay, well, I'm just going to leave this the way it is. Two files are in your models folder, an account viewmodels.cs and an identitymodels.cs. I think we actually have three, but I'm going to check to be sure. <clears throat> and we do. We also have the manage viewmodels.cs. <clears throat> Said it's good to know that the account management system in ASP.NET MVC runs on the same standard views, models, and controllers we use to build the rest of our application. And again, we will get into that in a few chapters. The models folder is nearly empty because the project template doesn't know what domains we're working with or the problem we're trying to solve. At this point, it says you might not even know what we're trying to solve. You might need to talk to customers and business owners. And again, I can't underlie the importance of that too much to, you know, when you're working on projects to keep the end user involved always. The ASP.NET framework doesn't dictate your process or methodologies. Eventually, you might decide that the first step in building a music store is having the ability to list, create, edit, and delete music album information. To add a new album class to the models folder, right-click on the models folder, choose Add Class, and name this Album. dot cs all right leave the existing using and namespace statements in here and enter the property shown in figure 41 to what we're working on well we haven't been doing a lot of this so let's do more of this by hand than we've been doing in the past now i can go and manually type in public virtual int Album ID get set. Not a problem. All right. There is a shortcut, and some people don't consider it to be a shortcut. But you can hit the tab key, type in the word prop, and hit the tab key twice. You can see that it gives you that. Some people like using this. All right. I think it's just as fast, to be honest with you, with what I'm doing right now. I'm going to have a total of eight properties. I'm getting that error now because, of course, you can't have the same property listed over and over again. So genre ID, artist ID. We've got a string representing the title. A decimal representing the price. A string representing the album URL. And we're going to have a sp couple special properties here. Genre, representing the genre. Of course, I don't need album ID then. All right. 
And finally, artist representing the artist. Now you'll notice the last two hit that are in here are giving us errors. And that's because we have not yet created a genre class and we have not yet created an artist class. We'll do that in just a minute. They do mention on the bottom of page 78, again, how Visual Studio has that uh, shortcut with prop, tap, tap. So. The primary purpose of the album model here is to simulate the attributes of a music album. Things like title, all right, and price. Every album also is associated with a single artist. When we say that, it doesn't mean that just it's one person, it's one artist. It could be a group or whatever. All right, we're going to model that using an artist class in just a second. So when we do this second class here, when we come in here and notice there's our album class, okay, and I probably should save. But if I right mouse click again on here and choose add and again choose class and now put in here artist.cs and click add. All right, what I want to show you here is notice that artist is still, all right, giving us an error. But when we come in here and we've got public virtual int artist ID get set. And we come in and we do our public virtual string. Oops. Name again with a get set. What I want you to understand is now when we go back to here, notice for artist, it's gone. And this is blue, meaning it's being used. All right, it's referencing something that exists. All right, let's save again. All right, and it says you may notice how each album has two properties for managing the artist. The artist property and the artist ID property. Going back again, we've got an artist property All right, you might notice how each album has two properties for managing the artist, an artist property and an artist ID property. The artist property that's right here is what's referred to as a navigational property. Given an album, you can navigate to that album's associated artist using the dot operator. All right, and if you say, I don't understand that, that's what the rest of the chapter is about. All right, the artist ID that's in here, this field right there, that's a foreign key property. All right, and basically, since we have artist ID here and we have artist ID here, what we're doing is we're taking the, the, the primary key in our artist table and we're adding it in as another field in our album table, all right? So there is a one-to-many relationship between artist and album. Any one artist can create zero, one, or more albums, and every one and every, you know, album is created by exactly one artist, all right? says you want to have the foreign key value for artist embedded in the model for your album because the foreign key relationship will exist between the table of artist records and the table of album records. All right. The navigational property, I gave you what they gave you in the book. But if we look here, entity framework relationships and navigation properties. They give you a pretty simple example here. There's a one-to-many relationship between department and course. One to, every department can have zero, one, or more courses, but
but every course belongs to only one department. Now, you may say, well, geez, you know, that isn't always true. Well, in this case, it's true. So it says the course table is dependent on, it's the dependent table because it contains the apart, department ID. So this is the foreign key that's put in here to link to the primary key in here. In an entity framework, an entity can be related to other entities through a relationship. Each relationship contains two ends that describe the entity and the multiplicity of the type. All right. So it says navigation properties can be used as a way to navigate an association between entities. Every object can have a navigation property for every relationship in which it participates. Navigation properties allow you to manage, navigate and manage relationships in both directions. It is recommended to include properties in the model of map to foreign keys in the database. All right. So the following image that's right here shows a conceptual model created with the entity framework designer. The model contains two entities that participate in the one-to-many relationships. Both entities have navigation properties. Course, or co right there, is the depend entity, and the department ID is a foreign key property. All right. I'd strongly recommend, maybe you didn't find that any, any more helpful than what you'd already heard, but I'd strongly recommend it as you start this, you go over and you take a look at this URL. Of course, it's not the only one, but it's a good place to start. All right. There was another one next to this, too, and I noticed with this other one, it was from another Microsoft one, Navigation Property. All right. And again, just, just Google Navigation Property, and of course you'll find these. There are other articles in here, too. All right, there's one from C Sharp Corner. There's a lot of other ones. They mention here a Navigation Property is an optional property on an entity type that allows for navigation from one end of an association to the other end. But they do not carry data. That's probably the key thing. They contain a name, the association, and the ends of the association. All right. Okay. <clears throat> An album also has an associated genre, and every genre can maintain a list of associated albums. So we're going to create a models class next. I'm sorry, a genre class, and that should get rid of that error that we have here. So we now have album and we now have artist. All right. And I'm going to right mouse click on models again, add class. Again, the name of this class is genre. It has four properties in it. So let's do the prop tab tab. The first one is a virtual int. And it is genre ID. And let's just copy. We'll have a string for the name. Another string for the description, depends again on how anal you are about all this stuff, and a list of albums of, that we're calling albums. Now you'll notice with this in here, these are, yet, are blue again, and if we jump back to our original album, we now have no errors. All right. <clears throat> so the author mentions in here, trying to keep up with where I was. I am up to page 80. 
So as you might notice that every property here is virtual. We discuss why properties are virtual later in the chapter. For now, these class definitions are the starting models include what we need to scaffold out a controller and some views. Now that we finished adding the code, we can compile the application and you must do that first because otherwise the system when you start to create the controllers and the like is going to get confused. We're not going to run this yet, but we just want to compile it. So we're going to build and build a solution. I can go out to my output window here and it should build with no problem. Compiling the newly added model class is important for two reasons. Number one, it serves as a quick check to make sure we didn't have any syntax errors. And number two, it says the newly added classes won't show up in the Virtual Studio scaffolding dialog that we're going to go over in just a minute until you've compiled the application. Compiling before using the scaffold scaffolding system is not just good practice. It's required for any new or changed models to show up in the scaffold dialogs. All right. So... After creating the model classes, we're ready to create a store manager. Notice as it says, the store manager is the controller, which will allow us to work with our album information. Now, one operation is to write the controller by hand, as we did in Chapter 2, and then manually create all the necessary views. The problem with doing that is, especially if you've got a lot of controllers you're going to use for the system, they call it repetitive work, and I'm not denying that it is, but again, it's one of those things of why do that when you really and truly don't have to. All right, it says using a process called scaffolding, we can basically get a lot of the work done for us. In the adding a view section in chapter three, we saw that the add view dialog could be used to allow us to select the template which, as it says, can then be used to create a code view for us. That was known as scaffolding. Scaffolding can do more than just create views. Scaffolding in an ASP.NET MVC app can be used to generate boilerplate code, which will allow for CRUD or create read, update, and delete functionality. Now, one thing to realize when you use scaffolding, it builds you, it gives you a start. If you're not doing very much in your project, you may have to do little touching of the code or changing of the code. That's not normally going to be the case. Now notice in here it says the scaffolding knows how to name controllers, how to name views, the beginning boilerplate code that goes into each component, and where to put these things as far as the right folder, etc., to put them in. All right. Scaffolding runs only when you tell it to run, so you don't have to worry about a code generator overwriting any changes that you've made. And they mentioned there, like nearly everything else in the MVC framework, if you don't like the default scaffolding behavior, you can replace it. You can also find alternative scaffolding templates through NuGet. Now, that's all important stuff. But that said, as you're learning this, you're probably best off not to make that many changes to the default stuff that you're going to get done for you. All right. Now, when we do this, so in other words, if we look right here, so if I come through here and I right mouse click on the controllers folder, first of all, notice that right now the controllers that we have are the ones that came when we created the project because we created an MVC project the account controller, the home controller, and the manage controller. But when I right mouse click here and choose add controller, it brings up this dialog with eight different possibilities. These are explained on pages 81 and 82. The other thing to realize also is you get a little explanation right here. Notice an, M an empty MVC controller. Basically, this will, if you, we've created this, it would create an index for us and no code other than that. It doesn't create any views. If we go to read-write action, it adds a controller to the project 
That controller will have index, an index action, a details action, a create action, an edit action, and a delete action. All right. These actions inside are not entirely empty, but they don't perform much, to be honest with you. Then we've got MVC5 controller with views using the entity framework. This is the one that we're going to use in just a minute to scaffold the store controller. It not only generates the controller with the entire set of index details, create, edit, and delete actions, but it also generates the required views and the code to persist in retrieving info from the database. Notice there's also an empty API controller. There's an API controller with actions an API controller with read-write, an API with entity framework, and an API um, OData v3. So there are several of these that are derived from the API controller base class. This is chapter 11, but again, I'm not going to be going through that. There's, no, there's just literally not enough time to go through two textbooks for one class. You may be that good. I'm sure as heck I'm not. For the template to generate the proper code, you have to select a model class, all right? And in this case, we're going to end up selecting the album class. So I believe they said in here, the MVC controller with read up write actions I'm sorry, the MVC controller with views using Entity Framework, that's the one we're going to use to scaffold or create our store controller. So we do that, and the system comes up, as said here, and it says to us, what model class are we going to use here? Well, we're going to be using the album model class. To generate the data access code, the scaffolding also needs the name of the data context object. You can point it to an existing one or you can create a new one. Then it says on page 82, what is the data context? To answer that, we'll need to take a short aside to give a quick introduction to the entity framework. If you have been watching the other, um, I'm getting up there in time. If you have been watching the other uh, presentations that I've been creating here, you already have been introduced to the entity framework. All right, so we just did that. Rather than going on right now into scaffolding in the entity framework, I am going to go on. But before I do, I'm going to end part one of this lecture and begin part two. So I'll be back in just a couple minutes.